Let me have you to open your Bibles this morning, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Ephesians 1. And as we get started, we're going to read verses 12, 13, and 14. Ephesians 1, verses 12, 13, and 14. The Apostle Paul writes to the believers in Ephesus, and he's describing what he calls God's own will, the end of verse 11, uh, for them and for all believers. And he says, beginning at verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. You notice that in these three verses, Paul says God's desire was for he and his companions to live, quote, to the praise of his glory. At verse 12, he says, we who first trusted in Christ. Then he says that God desired the same things for them. Verse 13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth. And he concludes verse 14, unto the praise of his glory. I think most people understand the idea of praise. You extol the qualities and the virtues of someone else, uh, and you are offering your gratitude and showing your thankfulness for something that they've done for you. We believe Jesus Christ deserves that kind of praise. But Paul also says the praise of his glory. A true believer's hope is to see his Savior finally take his rightful place as the absolute monarch of the earth and the ruler of the universe which he made. Think of the, the absolute sovereign over all of known reality, time, space, and matter. The Apostle Paul writes uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear... Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So a believer wants to see Jesus Christ face to face, but himself also now glorified like the resurrected Son of God. So according to our text, the Christian should live uh, a life honoring to God with that future event in mind. I certainly should. So should you. There's also great comfort to the believer between verses 13 and 14. It says, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. Earnest is a legal term. It's used in business and real estate transactions. Earnest money means a down payment. So what Paul is saying is the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within the Christian is simply the down payment of future blessings God has in store. Think about it that way. And the presence of the Holy Spirit inside you as a believer in Jesus Christ, and your future expectation of glorification with him, all of those things revolve around a little phrase found right in the middle of verse 13. It says, after that ye heard the word of truth, notice, the gospel of your salvation. Last year, a lady called me from, uh, I think, Franklin, North Carolina. And she had been watching our sermons on the Internet. And she asked if we could address a certain subject, the idol shepherd, I-D-O-L, shepherd, Zechariah 11, uh, which we did. I mentioned her name, Sister Rhonda, from Franklin, North Carolina. And last week, uh, another lady called me who is watching our videos on the Internet and in the course of our conversation, I said, I think this Sunday I'm going to try to preach on the simplicity of the gospel and the importance of salvation. As I said earlier, it's something we can't emphasize enough. And she said, that would be great. I have a couple of friends. I would love to watch your sermon and hear what you say about those things. Would you mention their names 
in your sermon. At least maybe they'll watch to the end of the, to the, end of the sermon. And so for uh, Antonio and Brian, two men, two friends of mine I haven't met yet, this is for you. And for anybody else who will benefit or can benefit from what I'm going to cover this morning. And excuse me for a moment. So the gospel of your salvation, that'll be the title we use today. I know it's not a flashy title. It's not a catchy title. Uh, it's not as fun as, you know, learning about the Loch Ness Monster on YouTube or, or, you know, whether we actually went to the moon or not or UFO conspiracies and Bigfoot and all of those things. Let me tell you something. If you're a Christian who sits at home in your pajamas or your underwear and all you do is watch videos about exciting things like that and you're not doing anything for God, you're pathetic. But point number one, let me say this. The gospel means good news. That's the simplest definition of the word gospel, good news. As cold waters are to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country, Proverbs 25, 25. That's why we support missionaries all around the world who are burdened that people in other countries hear about Jesus Christ. Paul also called it the gospel of Christ, Philippians 1, the gospel of God, Romans chapter 1, and he called it the glorious gospel, 1 Timothy chapter 1. He also called it my gospel, Romans chapter 2, verse 16, simply meaning the gospel God had called him to go out and preach. Let me ask you a question now. If the gospel means good news, then what is it? We say it, you know, it means good news. What is it? If it's good news, tell me what it is. Go, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 1 through 4. Paul, the apostle, writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you on a previous trip, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you. Don't forget it. Unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. No notice. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The, the gospel the apostle Paul preached, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, the glorious gospel, the gospel we profess our faith in, the gospel we endeavor to preach from this place and abroad, is, that, is the good news that a substitute was found for your sake. Amen. A substitute was found for your sake. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Somebody else died on your behalf and was punished for your sins. Right after the Apostle Paul makes a, a very a sweeping statement, Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He describes Jesus Christ in verse 25 by saying, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. If you don't appreciate the vocabulary of the King James Bible, you're cheating yourself. Propitiation means a, a satisfactory offering to appease the wrath of God, to appease the judgment of God. No man was able to do that for you. So God came to this world in the form of a man, and did it himself, in the person of Jesus Christ. The Apostle John said much the same thing, echoed the same sentiment as the Apostle Paul. He says, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 4, verse 10. It's something we can't emphasize enough, the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ for the sake of the sinner, on the sinner's behalf, in place of the sinner. When my son was four years old, 
we were sitting in church uh, in Pensacola at that time, one Sunday night, and I think he was on the pew between my wife and I, maybe coloring, drawing on a piece of paper. Dr. Ruckman was preaching. And in the middle of, of the sermon, he looked up my, my wife and I with tears in his eyes and said, I want Jesus. Well, you never know how much a four-year-old is really grasping. And that's something you want to be very uh, careful and delicate with. So when we went home, uh, he and I went in his bedroom, and uh, I wanted to see if he still had it on his mind. And I said, what if your younger sister, Elizabeth, got spanked instead of you for something you had done? And Daddy and Mommy were mad. Wouldn't that be a good thing for her to do? In a way, Jesus did that for every sinner. And he said, do you mean Jesus died instead of the sinner? Four years old. That's exactly what I mean. He grasped a hold that he was a sinner and needed God to forgive him. And only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. Jesus Christ died as a substitute for the sinner, for the sake of the sinner, on the sinner's behalf, so that the sinner wouldn't have to be judged for his own sins. He let Christ take that judgment instead. But uh, that's the gospel, the good news that the Son of God came into the world as a man. He lived among men, walked among men. He can identify with men, but he never sinned the way men do in either thought, word, or deed, or even any indirect gesture. The Lord Jesus Christ never committed a sin. And so as a perfect man, he was qualified to die as a substitute on men's behalf. He took the judgment for sin that every sinner should have received. That should be good news to anybody. That's the gospel. Uh, point number two, let me say this. The gospel is not religion. The gospel is not religion. God knows we have plenty of religions in the world. Don't you know that? I was checking out an article online yesterday that said there are uh, about 4,300 recognized religions throughout the world. And of course, a myriad of offshoots from any one of those. Thousands and thousands of religions. And since the Hindus count about 300 million different gods in their society, theoretically, you could have 300, different, uh, 300 million different religions just in one country. But, uh, you know, the atheists have a point when they say that too many wars have been started because of some religious squabble, some religious dispute. And they're right about that. Man-made religions with their rituals and traditions and expectations and restrictions and arbitrary laws to follow can never save a soul from hell. They can't do it. Christ told the Samaritan woman at the well, John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I would submit to you that New Testament Bible-believing Christianity, which we profess, is the most spiritual faith of all. Why do I say that? Because our religion doesn't require statues, images, icons. Our religion, our faith doesn't require the burning of incense, the lighting of candles, it doesn't require a string of beads to count your prayers or a knotted rope like some religions use. It doesn't require a special clerical class of minister or monk or priest wearing unusual clothing. It doesn't require a certain con uh, uh, forming the body into a certain position uh, or a certain prescribed haircut. It doesn't require us to pray in a certain direction to a geographical holy site on the earth. It doesn't require the ringing of bells during certain religious ceremonies to signify something or other. It doesn't require any of that. Amen. Those are all props. Those are all theatrical uh, add-ons. There's a lot of, you know, they say the light and the candle represents the light of Christ. The incense represents our prayers. The white garments represent the purity of our hearts. Everything's a symbol, but there's not a lot of substance. Amen. 
So I would say our faith is the most spiritual of all. You know something? God gave us one, only one, physical, tangible object that we hold in our hands and his, through his providence and by which we learn the mind of God, learn the words of God, learn the desires of God, learn his judgment towards sinners, learn his uh, provision of forgiveness and salvation for the saint. We learn all of those things through a book. When we read the book, it's God's chance to speak to us, and he allows us to speak to him when we pray. It's a two-way conversation. But uh, religion gets in the way. You can have a lot of religion and not have anything real. And Paul said, for if righteousness come by the law, and in his case he meant the Jewish religious law, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians 2, verse 21. There's no need for a substitutionary sacrifice on your, be on your behalf if you can earn it through some religious effort. No need for that at all. Church membership doesn't mean guarantee that your name is recorded in heaven. So the gospel is not religion. Thirdly, let me say this. The gospel is not water baptism. If you're still in 1 Corinthians 15, go back to chapter 1 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians 15 and chapter 1. Here the same book by the same author. Part of the same letter he sent to the church in the city of Corinth. And notice there verses 16 and 17. He says, And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. How about that? Paul's conclusion is that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ are enough to do everything necessary for the salvation of the sinner. If there's some gesture you're trying to add to it, such as water baptism, you nullify the whole thing. The whole thing's made null and void. It's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholics, Lutherans, Anglicans, some Presbyterians, some United Methodists, uh, Congregationalists, some uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, um, a whole host of other groups, the Church of Christ and other cults, all use the same scriptures, they quote and misquote the same scriptures from the Bible to try to prove that water baptism is somehow a necessary component of you getting saved from your sin and forgiven by God. They all use the same scriptures, but it's our church, not your church. And the other group says, no, it's our church, not your church. Those of us who call ourselves Baptists, we believe in water baptism least of all. Go figure. We believe that water baptism is a, a picture of your salvation. Your sins are washed away, but it's not the means of it. Water baptism never saved anyone from their sins. Never brought, uh, affected eternal life for anyone. Point number four, let me say this. The gospel is for sinners. The gospel is for sinners. Paul told his own disciple, Timothy, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he says of himself, of whom I am chief, 1 Timothy 1, 15. He didn't come into the world to lead a revolution, like the, the liberation theology Catholic priests were preaching in Central America back in the 80s, as overthrow the government. That's what Jesus wants us to do. He didn't come to fight environmentalism and, and stop global warming, right? He didn't come as a social justice warrior to defend gay marriage or, or defend abortion rights or women's rights uh, or some socialistic utopian idea. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? He came to save you. Carl Menninger, and I've told you this story before, but Carl Menninger was the unofficial dean of American 
psychotherapy, psycho psychology, psychiatry, for many years. Founded the Mendinger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, and the Winter Veterans Hospital in Kansas, the largest uh, mental health training institute in the world. I think he received the Medal of Freedom from President Carter in 1977. One of the last books he ever wrote was called Whatever Became of Sin. And Dr. Menninger wasn't a Christian. But he said, whatever became of sin. And he saw that the trend that psychiatry and psychology were taking even back 40 years ago, that eventually, and we've gotten to that point now, no misfortune in your life is your fault. It's always the fault of someone else. It was caused by outside influences you had no control over. And you are not responsible for the mess you've made of your life. Someone else is to blame. That's where we are now. You know, even AA, the 12 steps, one of their first points is uh, admitting you, you need help. You have to admit you have a problem. If you're not willing to admit it, then you can't get help. But I have a copy of his book in my office. And in the introduction to the book, he talks about a man who stood on a busy a street corner in Chicago back in the 60s. And as people were on their way to work one morning, the man stood like a statue and he'd point at them and say, guilty. Another one over here, guilty. And obviously the man was being dramatic, but Dr. Menninger says, the amazing reactions of uh, people out on the street, how did he know about that, right? My husband doesn't know about that. And Dr. Menninger's point was illustrating that just below the surface, everybody knows they've violated a higher law of right and wrong, of good and evil. Getting them to admit it is the problem. So if you can find Baptists and Methodists and Catholics and Presbyterians. You can find atheists and skeptics. You can find Democrats and Republicans. But find a sinner. Where's a sinner? If you can just find a sinner, God has something good he wants to do for them. God wants to forgive their sins. God wants to grant them eternal life. When I was six years old, I'll make this personal for a moment. When I was six years old, uh, and it's, it's a, uh, an abiding blessing for me that I'm standing in the same place where I first heard the gospel at six years old. My father was the pastor. We had different seats in the auditorium in those days. In those days, we had like the fold up and down seats like you'd have in a movie theater or an old courthouse. And that's what we had. And I was sitting in the front row right there. My mother always sat in the second row behind me. I think if I misbehaved, she could smack the back of my head, you know. But one day, November 5th, 1967, I was paying attention to what my dad said. He was describing the gospel and describing that God has a right to judge sinners without Jesus Christ. And for the first time, I paid attention and I realized, well, I know I've disobeyed my dad and mom. If that counts as sin, then I'm guilty too. And in my mind, all these things were working uh, quickly, if God has a right to judge sinners, that includes me. So when my dad gave an invitation call, uh, with tears in my eyes, I walked from there down here to the front. And all I remember praying was, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I had already admitted I was a sinner to God before I left my seat. I already knew that. God, came, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come in to save you know, rich people or Poor people. He came into the world to save sinners. He didn't come into the world to save celebrities and movie stars. He came into the world to save sinners. So no matter what your status or your station in life, what you need to do is admit that you're a sinner. So the gospel requires something of you. It requires you to admit to God you're a sinner and you need his help. That's what it requires of you. How does someone in America live to be 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, sometimes older. You know, I work for a funeral home during my day, during my days, my weekly job. I've been at the funerals of people well over 100 years old, 
and nothing was said about them that indicated they knew anything about God at all. How does someone live to be that old in America without ever admitting they have a problem or they have faults or they have flaws? They have something that needs to be corrected. And yet, many people do. It's sad. It's pathetic. But let me move on. Our first text this morning said, the gospel of your salvation. So let me consider the importance of salvation. To say that salvation, the, the saving, the forgiving of an eternal soul is important. That's a great understatement, right? It's the most important thing. The Lord Jesus asked, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark chapter 8. You might have a good job. You might be financially secure. You have a nice home. You're in good health. You have a lot of friends. But if you die and leave this world without making things right with God, your life had no purpose at all. Not at all. About 20 years ago, it was before 9-11, so 19 or 20 years ago, I was working for a funeral home here in Ontario. Right across the street from that mortuary is a McDonald's restaurant. What a great location, right, by the funeral home. We had just concluded a funeral in our chapel, and the casket and the pallbearers and the crowd, they all got in their cars, and they were heading down the road to the cemetery. Well, I was back at work, and I was going to walk through the front lobby and go across the street and get a hamburger. And there was a guy sitting in the lobby who had been at the funeral, and evidently the ride he was with, they took off without him. He said, well, my friends left without me. I guess they'll miss me eventually and come back and pick me up. And I said, and I never said this to anyone before, and I've never said it to anyone since. But I, the words came out of my mouth. I said, Don, you know, I'm going across to get a hamburger. You're welcome to join me if you want. Okay, great. So we walked across the street, and we're standing in line there waiting to order. And he begins asking me, what do you think about the things the minister said a little while ago? I said, how do you mean? Well, my father was a Catholic, and my mom was a Presbyterian, and... Uh, I don't know what I believe. I'm not sure what I think. What do you think? And I said, well, I call myself a Baptist, but I've read the Bible several times. And this is a Bible truth, not a Baptist truth. And that God made man, gave him a free will. But man, by his own free will, rebelled and disobeyed against God. So he broke off his own fellowship with his creator. But since God still loved the man, but he couldn't let the guilt of that man's sin enter into his presence, he had to do something about it. So he came into the world as a man, the person of Jesus Christ, lived a life that men live, was victorious over sin and temptation, and as a sinless man, was able to die as a pure substitute on the man's behalf. He died for the sake of that man. So that man can be forgiven. The righteousness and the goodness of Jesus Christ can be given to that man. And that man's sins can then be transferred to the death of Jesus Christ, even 2,000 years ago. And uh, everything's made, back, made right once again. Well, by this time, we had, were sat down at our table. And he said, you know, I'm 62 years old. My wife of... 31 years has told me she wants a divorce and um, I'm kind of beside myself I'm not sure what to do and I said Don I don't think it was an accident for your friends to leave and you and I to meet I said what I would suggest to you is I said I don't know what may happen with your wife when you go back home he had flown out from Chicago I said it cost him ten dollars uh, round trip from Chicago back here. He worked for American Airlines. He got in a jump seat. Cost him 10 bucks to fly back and forth from Chicago to California. I said, uh, I don't know what God might do with your marriage. I said, but what you ought to do is you need to make things right with God right now for your own sake. And so right there, not long after, right over that 
Big Mac wrapper on the table there. He was praying in that restaurant, asking God to forgive him of his sins, making Jesus Christ his Savior, and uh, admitting he knew Jesus Christ died for his sins. And in the best way he knew how, he was asking God to uh, grant him eternal life as well. Well, we parted uh, after that. And, of course, you wonder, did he really mean business with God? Was it something he said at the moment and then forgot later on? And I, for many years, I intended to call him and get reacquainted and see if he was really serious at the time. Well, years went by. Two years ago, this would have been at least 17 years after the fact, I looked him up. Of course, now we have the Internet. You can look up anybody. I looked him up, called his house. His wife picked up. And he had passed away the month before. I waited too long. I didn't get to talk to him. But I told her who I was. I told her about my conversation with her husband. And she said, you know, he mentioned that a number of times over the years. And we went to church together after that. And I said, he meant business. I was comforted to know that he was serious with God. And his wife hadn't left him. So you never know what God might do. But the most important thing is for the sinner to trust in what Jesus Christ alone can do for him. Um, salvation is the most important thing. In Luke 12, Christ preached about a rich man who had great abundance. And the man said, I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? You know, after you die, someone else will live in your house. Somebody else will be wearing your suit. Someone else will be driving your motorcycle or your car. Someone else will be courting your wife or using your golf clubs. <laughs> and then Jesus said, so is uh, he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There in Luke 12, verses 19 through 21. It was an amazing uh, conversation I had with that man. And I thank God for it. Salvation means you've been delivered from the wrath, delivered from the judgment of God, rescued from it. You, have no, you no longer ha need to fear going to hell. That should be a blessing in itself. It's not just a temporary reprieve until the next time you sin. But the death of Jesus Christ for your sake covers all of your sins, past, present, and even those in the future you've yet to commit. You say, how do you know that? Well, the Bible says, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Hebrews 10, verse 14. And the text we first began with, Ephesians chapter 1, says, in whom, Christ, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession. If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Savior, to save your soul from the consequence of your sins, from eternal judgment in hell and the wrath of God, God gives the Holy Spirit as a down payment on you. And one day he's going to take possession of that, per possession of that purchase that he's made in its entirety. Body, soul, and spirit will all belong to him. And I'm going to bring this to a close right about here. But the gospel of your salvation is what every sinner needs to hear, needs to embrace. Now, when Paul and Silas ran into the, uh, the Philippian jailer, Acts 16, verse 30, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They didn't say, well, here's Billy Graham's 240-page book, How to Be Born Again. Read that. 
They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You don't have to understand all the theological ramifications, all the implications that come with it. That's part of growing in your knowledge of Jesus Christ afterwards. But it's not by anything you can do. It's not by any amount of money you can give to some charitable uh, cause or endeavor. It's not by letting your conscience be your guide. It's not doing more good deeds than bad deeds. I've told you before, let's say you're 40 years old, 45 years old. And for the most part, you've lived for yourself. You've really never done much for other people. And you get along. I mean, you're not arrested. You're not in jail. But you're interested in making yourself happy. And then something pricks your conscience. You, you realize, you know, maybe I should give back to the world around me and stop taking everything for myself. And someone tells you, well, you know, you're going to be judged by how much good you've done versus how much bad you've done. And you kind of think, well, all right, I guess I should do more good than bad. You're already 45 years behind. How are you going to catch up? So just letting your conscience be your guide, trying to do more good than bad, that'll never get you there. That'll never get you there. And uh, in John chapter 6, the Lord Jesus asked his disciples if they would go away and, and forsake him. And Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And then Peter says in Acts 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus told the apostle Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The apostle Paul said, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, 1 Timothy 2, 5. And the Apostle John writes, This is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12. The gospel and the, the uh, blessing of salvation are all wrapped up in a person, in Jesus Christ. You either have him or you have nothing. If you have him, you know where you're going when you die. If you don't, then you don't, but you need to.